Today I'm very happy to have with me Professor Mary Jane Rubenstein from Wesleyan University. She's an expert in many, many things, but in particular today we're going to talk about the multiverse from a more religious and historical perspective. Okay, Mary Jane, welcome. Thank you. And so why don't you start by giving us a very broad perspective on what does the multiverse even mean? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think broadly we can use the term multiverse to signify the hypothesis that everything we can see, whatever, whatever, wherever we are in history, everything we can see is just one little part of a vast compendium of a whole bunch of other things that we could see if we were in that place, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so you can use the multiverse as a term across history to refer to the hypothesis that there are many, many other worlds elsewhere. And is this, this is a very old idea, right? So do you have an idea of when did it more or less start? Yeah, sure. Well, there, are, so it depends on where you're looking globally. Um, Hindu cosmology has this notion that the world goes through periodic cycles mm. of uh, generation and degeneration. Um, and that dates back just millennia. Um, so you have a kind of cyclical multiverse where the universe gets sort of regenerated from time to time. Um, Buddhist cosmologies also have notions of an infinite number of worlds sort of spatially arranged. Sometimes they're hierarchically arranged, sometimes they're sort of out there in space more horizontally. Um, and it seems that that kind of Buddhist cosmology, that many worlds Buddhist cosmology, um, was in conversation um, with a trend of Greek philosophy that begins in a about the fifth, maybe sixth century BCE, um, which is known as atomism. It seems like the ancient atomists were in actually conversation with ancient Indian philosophers, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and what the ancient atomists said was that our whole world, our cosmos is the word in Greek, um, our whole world is just one of an infinite number of other worlds. Some of these worlds are just like ours, uh, some of them are totally different from ours, mm -hmm. and they're just randomly generated through the collision of atoms. Okay, so, so from what you're saying, there are kind of two different ways of thinking about the multiverse. You have like a multiverse in time. Yeah which basically means there is one universe right. that's sort of like a phoenix yeah. universe that is born, does its thing, dies, is reborn, and keeps doing that forever yeah. and ever in right. a sort of a cyclic universe yeah. style. And then you have another one where you have a spread out in space kind of multiverse, mm -hmm. right? And these two ideas seem to have coexisted in the past. Sure. I mean, so ancient Greece is, is an example of this. In about the 5th century BCE, so we're talking about 2,500 years ago, right. um, we have two rival multiverses. One is primarily spatial. This is the multiverse of the atomists. So we've got our world here and then other worlds beyond it odd infinitum, just, they just go on for infinity. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had the Stoics, who were their rivals. Um, the Stoics and the Atomists really hated each other. They had two different schools, nobody talked to each other. Um, and the Stoics said, no, actually, it's not the case that there are many worlds in an infinite universe. There's just one world. The world is the universe. The world and the universe are the same thing. There's just one. Um, but every like once in a while, um, the sun uh, bakes the earth to such an extent that the earth sets on fire um, and the whole earth is absolutely destroyed and reduced to almost nothing and just totally destroyed. Um, but there's like a little bit of a sort of moist principle and a little bit of a dry principle and these two things interact and they eventually create a whole new world. Wow. So that's this sort of yeah. cyclical idea. So exactly, I think that the two basic models are the sort of spatial plurality on the one hand and the cyclical temporal um, plurality on the other hand. And then we move on to the modern yeah. versions of the multiverse, right? I mean, so here we are uh, apparently rediscovering some old knowledge here and dressing it with the language of modern science. So how do you position, you know, the modern ideas of multiverse, you know, in this historical slash religious context? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I, because, uh, of course, the, the Einsteinian notion, um, which was hearkening back to people like Cusa and Bruno, um, seemed at least to get displaced by the triumph of the Big Bang hypothesis yeah. in 1965, right? It seemed like what you had then was mm -hmm. a universe that actually began Mm -hmm. Right, that had to be. It was not eternal as Einstein had hoped, um, but <laughs> that that began somewhere, and uh, so that was in in that sense finite, at least had temporally finite. Had a birth, yeah, exactly. Right. And you know, Christian theologians were very excited about this because they were saying that looks a lot like the story we've been telling. Right, we've been telling <laughs> the story about how there was nothing, and then there was a big flash of light, and then there was a whole bunch of stuff. Right, that looks just like we, what we've been saying. Right. Um, right. So th these these stories sort of toggle back and forth as we as we move on through the century. Um, what, what goes on in the, the late 20th century is that the notion that there might be many universes other than this one starts like emerging from all kinds of different places in physics. Um, in, the, in the late 60s, it starts coming out of, uh, out of quantum mechanics with the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, in the late 80s, it starts emerging out of uh, a developing inflationary cosmology. In the early 2000s, it starts emerging out of developments in string theory. So it's it, all of these different mm -hmm. um, physicists are somehow like colliding with with multiverses. Um, what's striking to me, though, is that the 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 notion of multiple universes was a really fringe idea and not taken very seriously until fairly recently. It, it seems like it's only about a decade that it's been a kind of respectable possible scientific hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, and and we can you know talk about why this may be the case. Um, but part of the reason that um, that the multiverse gets so much sort of sudden attention and suddenly looks like it might actually be viable, I think, um, is that it looks like it provides a good alternate interpretation for fine tuning. Right? That What's that? Right, so the, 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 the idea is that the more physicists learn about the fundamental configuration of our universe, um, the more it seems that if any of the constants of nature were any different than it is, we wouldn't be able to have a universe at all. Right. Um, specifically, not one filled with stars that birth elements that give us planets and that give us things like this. Um, so, you know, if gravity were were any stronger, planets couldn't stay in orbit around the sun; they would just sort of collapse into the sun, and we would all be sort of being crushed under the force of gravity. Um, so it seems like everything has to be just right in order to get the kind of world that we have. It's the Goldilocks universe. Goldilocks principle, right? This one is just right and I've got a universe. So the question is like, what, how did all, each of these constants, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, gravity, the cosmological constant, the mass of the electron, like how did all these get precisely to the value they need to be so that we could get the kind of universe we have? And just you know, strictly philosophically speaking, the easiest answer is, well, somebody must have done it. <laughs> like somebody must have set each of these constants just right to give us this kind of universe. Um, what the multiverse does is it gives you an alternative explanation. It says, well, look, if universes are being generated all the time, then those universes could each try on different different values. You could have a universe with a whole lot of gravity and a universe with a whole lot of cosmological concepts. And for the, the ones that wouldn't support life just wouldn't work out, right? Um, but every once in a while, a universe will have the right combination of constants that it needs to, to give us a universe filled with stars. And we seem to be in one of those universes. So is that why this British astrophysicist Bernard Carr says if you don't want to God, if you don't want a God, you better have a multiverse? Yeah, I think this is just what he means. That you can either explain the fine tunings through something like an extra cosmic creator, or you can explain the fine tunings through infinity and accident, which is what the multiverse gives us. And so to answer your question about the historical legacy of ancient multiverse cosmologies, this is exactly what the atomists were up against 2,500 years ago when they were saying there are an infinite number of worlds. What they were trying to do was to displace what they called superstitio, super, uh, religion as superstition, um, the notion that our world was created for us by benevolent gods. Um, they were worried about this idea. They thought that it caused 
forced people to act terribly, to make human sacrifices, um, to uh, believe silly things. And so their, their whole effort was to displace that idea that there were creators um, by saying, no, 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 there's not a creator. There are actually infinite worlds instead, and they're generated yeah. accidentally. So you get that same sort of philosophical problem resurrecting itself. Physics says, okay, these are the constants. How do they work and what can we do with them, right? Um, and how, how do they make things go, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do they make things go this way, this way, all the rest of it? Um, but the question, why are these constants the way they are, seems to me to be a metaphysical question. Right. Um, the why, I think, is a metaphysical question, which doesn't mean physicists ought not to be doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just that I think that is the point at which the only answers you can get to that why question become, seem like they're maybe on the, on the, on the borders, on the edges of what counts as, as physics, right? That the, yeah. those answers, whether it's God, whether it's a multiverse, whether it's some, it are going to be extra cosmic principles. Mm -hmm. And uh, physics, by definition, works on intracosmic principles. So that, that seems, I don't know if, if, if you... No, could. I think that that's exactly right. It, 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 in a sense, by asking these questions about the origins of the constants of nature, mm -hmm. We're sort of trying to elevate physics into a explanatory theory that explains itself, right. and that's sort of a hardcore thing to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, I can see the temptation because you know, after all, the dream of physics is to explain as much as we can of the world. Right. So in a sense, it's following that tradition. You know, we want to know everything there is to know, right? But I think it's sort of stepping ahead of its own conceptual framework in a sense that maybe physics is just not prepared to do it. Mm -hmm. And by creating these theories, in particular the multiverse theory, that has a whole debate about it where can you actually even test this theory, you know, in an in a observational way to make sure the multiverse exists. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can push things really hard to make some some tests, mm -hmm. which are like, you know, if two universes collide, that you'd have some signature. What would you have? Right. But honestly, you know, those are very vague hypotheses. And more than that, they assume a whole lot of physics in order to create those collisions between universes. It means that if this other universe existed and it was expanding and collided with us, yeah. The physics there would have to be very close to the physics here because we'd have to be using similar principles. Right. For example, the speed of light yeah. and other things. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's our almost like us mm -hmm. kind of thing universe. The problem for cosmology, I think, unlike any other science, is that it is irretrievably and inescapably inside the thing it's trying to study, mm -hmm. right? Any other science can get outside the yeah. thing it's trying to study and then look at it from the outside and say, right. oh, I understand, I can see it as a whole. Um, the problem for cosmology, of course, is that we're inside the thing that we're trying to understand and so that our perspective is necessarily bound by that insidedness. Whether, whether our telescopes are up on mountains or even on satellites and balloons, wherever they are, we're still inside the universe. Right. Um, and so any kind of attempt to explain what it was that gave rise to our universe, or whether there's something beyond it, whether there's some sort of extra cosmic generating principle that gives rise to universes, is going to require that we take the laws and the phenomena that we observe inside the universe and project them outside the universe and say they must obtain there too, right? They must take place there too. They must also be at work there too. Um, so the multiverse, for example, would have to obey quantum field theory. Yeah. Who knows, right? Yeah. Who knows? But th right. these are these are assumptions that we make and and again for somebody who studies religion, this is a move that theologians have done for millennia to say the the deity or deities that gave rise to our world look in some way like us. Right, that they look, they, they have traits that we are familiar with. Either they're conscious or they're reproductive or they're vegetal or whatever they are. But they all require you to take something that we observe inside the universe and then ascribe it to the author of the universe. And we just have no idea.